Welcome to Slow Art Friday. My name is Christy McMillan. I'm the Museum's Director of Learning and Engagement, and I'm joined today by Steve Bennett and Hank Bo Bovey, two of our touring docents who will be leading today's discussion. <sighs> you guys, it's one of those mornings. You can see my slides now too. <laughs> I apologize, everyone. <laughs> Each Friday at 12 p.m. while the museum is closed, docents lead virtual interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection or special exhibitions. The goal is simple. Slow down, discover the joy of looking at art, and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Hank and Steve will lead us in an interactive conversation about three works in our collection. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so with each one. Hank and Steve will allow us time to look at each work on our own slowly before leading a conversation about each one with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in dialogue with Hank, Steve, myself, and each other throughout the hour. A few notes before we get started. You probably noticed that your microphones and video were muted by default. We welcome you to uh, unshare your, uh, or sorry, to share your video so that we can see who we're talking to. And in just a moment, I will make it so that folks can mute, unmute themselves as well. Choose a quiet room and close the door. Please silence any alerts from nearby devices. All of those dings can be uh, pretty distracting once we get started. Uh, if you do choose to turn on your video, try not to sit in front of a window, lamp, or other strong uh, source of light or movement. Use headphones and microphone for best sound quality. Use a desktop, laptop, or tablet to see slides and meeting tools on a larger screen. Make sure that your screen name includes your first name and last initial or first name and last name so that we know who that we're talking to. In order to ask questions and make comments throughout the program, you'll be able to unmute your microphone when Steve or Hank ask for questions or comments. You can also type any questions or comments that you have into the chat box. A third way to participate is to raise your hand in the participant sidebar and Hank or Steve or I will call on you and unmute your microphone. This is usually not the most expedient way to participate, so we do encourage you uh, when you have thoughts, comments, questions to just go ahead and unmute yourself. Finally, we are recording, so if you prefer not to be recorded, make sure that your video and audio remain muted and use the chat box to submit any questions or comments that you have. At this time, I'm going to make it so that you all can uh, unmute yourselves uh, whenever you'd like. Please do leave your microphone muted unless you're actively asking a comment or uh, asking a comment, asking a question or making a comment. I'm going to turn off my microphone in just a minute so that I can just <laughs> sit back and enjoy the program with you all. Before we get started, does anybody have any questions? All right, Hank and Steve, what will we be talking about today? Right. Good afternoon. I am Hank Bovey as uh, Chrissy Sanatorium docent. This afternoon, our Slow Art Friday topic is, is it art part four? So for some of you, you've been through parts one, two, and three, because I see some familiar faces out there and familiar names. For others, this might be your first is it art. So typically in the past for is it art, I've selected works that were either very abstract, um, the kind of works that tend to make people ask the question, um, well, what makes this museum worthy? Or they may also have the comment that my second grader could do this. So we've looked at those and talked about um, the value of those works to the art world. We've also looked at some photographs with similar questions of, is that photograph just a document of a time or place, or is it a work of art? So that's what we've done in the past. Today, Steve and I thought we'd move things in a little different direction. And as you um, saw from the pictures, um, we've chosen functional or utilitarian pieces. Um, and we're going to ask that same question. When we look at those pieces, we'll talk about what we see. But we'll also try to think about, you know, is this piece art? What's my definition of art? And if I think it's art or don't think it's art, why or why not? So with that said, as Chrissy said, well, I'll give you a few moments to look at a piece. 
then we'll have a little conversation about that artwork. So with that said, Chrissy, if you would go ahead and put the first slide up there, and then everyone take a few moments to look at this, and then we'll ask some, I'll ask some questions, and we'll talk about it. All right, if you, you've had a few moments to look at this, and with that said, I'll ask the first question. And as Chrissy mentioned before, just when you have a comment, observation, question, whatever, feel free just to jump in there and ask it or, or um, you know, let us know what you're looking at. So what do you think is going on with this artwork? What, what do you see? I really like this piece. Um, it looks like blown glass to me, and it looks like a forest, like trees but yet you can see through it to the other side. And I'm intrigued by the darker colors and then the um, greens at the top and the bottom. So as Laurel's observed, this does look like trees. Um, and as she's mentioned, you can actually see through it. So that kind of gives it a bit more dimension, I think. What else do we see? I, I This is Joey. I, I like the fact that there, at the bottom there's a fence and there's a little gateway. So for me, it's like I can walk through that gateway and be in the middle of this piece of glass and look outside, you know, look from inside out. That's what I, I'm getting from this work. So I love that. And I did not notice. I noticed the fence, but I actually didn't really pick up on the gate until you mentioned that, that you can actually kind of gives you a little entrance into the interior of the, of the artwork. So very good. What else do we see? It looks like there's a gate on the far side as well. There's a break in the, in the wire. I doubt this piece was ever meant to really hold a bunch of flowers, but can't you see how it would add to the forest to have the long stems in there? You know, and, and I had that same thought when I was looking at it, that the, the what we think might be trees um if we did have a bunch of flowers in there they just mimic that same pattern of the of the flower stem so so excellent what else do we see it looks like water at the bottom so it, what, what do you see that makes you say that it looks like blue blue circles or something yeah so, Barbara, I do see that as well, that there are some blue circles down in there and um, gives it a water, uh, a water effect. Or, and there's a or path, it could be a, a forest path. floor. I'm sorry, Joy, what was there's that? A path. I, I could see at the bottom, it looks like there's a little red or brown. It might be through that gate, like a little pathway to go in. That's what gave me that feeling that you could walk in there. The green in the back or the blue to me looks like a grassy area, perhaps with some flowers or vegetables or something growing back there. So when you say back there, exactly where, where are you seeing that? In that blue area, yeah, th exactly. Okay. On the, on the okay. far side from where we would enter the gate from this side. But I'd also be interested in the technique. Um, if I could speak to the artist, I would ask, you know, um, how long it took to make and what was the inspiration and how, how is the technique to get this three dimensional um, glass blowing done? Yeah, I, I agree. I look, this is, this is my favorite of the three. I looked at this and I thought that's got to be incredibly difficult having watched a lot of glass blowing in our area, in my area and having some local artists. But it, I uh, just now noticed the fence about the same time, I guess, uh, that that Joey mentioned it. The bottom, the bottom part, which looks like a forest floor or others have said water, I, I don't think I've ever seen glass uh, vases that have that kind of bot bottom part. And that was sort of intriguing to me. Anyway, I, I really like this piece. <laughs> mm -hmm. It looks to me, it looks like um, I feel like walking through this open gate, and there is a forest floor floor here of grass and uh, and leaves, and um, 
just lying down and looking up at this beautiful, beautiful structure. Yeah, I might have to make myself very small, but I can just really see that it is amazing. Yeah. Also at the top left and right, there's sort of look, look like white flowers. I'm not sure if those are reflections somehow. It looks like a white donut with like a little hole in either side of it in the middle. Like a white umbrella. umbrella. It would be nice to turn it sure. to see it from all angles. And Barbara, I agree. That's one of the, oh, hi, I guess the disadvantages to uh, Slow Art Friday is we don't always have the 3D view, especially of 3D artworks. But, um, but I love what you all are, are saying about all this besides the bigger picture of the, what we're calling trees, that there's this whole world going on inside of this artwork that you actually pulls you in that you want to step in. So I think that's wonderful. What else do we see there? Uh, uh, I have a question. Can, has anyone seen this in person? Can you see through it or is it opaque? I have seen it in person and it is uh, translucent. And uh, my thoughts on it are, it's so organic. And uh, to just peer into this thing, uh, you can almost imagine yourself lying on your back and looking up into the trees like you would in a big forest. But uh, I think this would be beautiful just in an area that catches the light. I wouldn't put anything in and I think it's meant entirely as a, a beautiful decorative object mm -hmm. that, you know, just overwhelms you. The fence makes it something different. It takes it away. It moves it into a different kind of piece. To me, it's not just a beautifully executed vase with the idea or with the execution of that fence, uh, fence post, the opening, the exit on the other side. Um, there, there is something very important additional going on that I find exciting. So, I think it looks alive. I mean, there's no people here. There's really not a lot of motion or action. I don't really feel that it's very windy, but I get, feel very sunny at the top. And I'm not sure who a little while ago said, just laying on your back and just looking up at the trees and the, the, the sky and being in there, it just makes you feel a sense of like being alive. So I love that, Laurel, that it looks alive to you. And also <laughs> to go back, um, I think it was Karen that mentioned the, the fence, what an important part of the work that is. And I think that's a good comment because the fence is, you know, in the grand scheme of things, a, a small detail, but it really changes the whole, our whole view of that work, I think, from what I'm hearing from all of you. So, and in the chat, Sally said a comment that it's like a stage set waiting for the action to begin. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. So let me just get, mention a couple of things here. Um, the artist, uh, Mark Pizer, is also a poet and also studied piano at one time in his life. So with those two thoughts, does that give you any more insight into this artwork? Does it make you see some things that you might not have seen otherwise? Oh, very definitely. I, I write poetry, I have for many years. I belong to a poetry group at Ali. I'm an on and off writer, but uh, I can immediately see that connection. Yeah, yeah. It it shows us a definite sensibil sensitivity. Expand on that if you wouldn't mind, Barbara. When you say sensitivity, what what do you see there that that kind of makes you that gives you that sense of sensitivity or makes you say that? Uh, well, I think musicians. Um, and artists and writers and poets, to be really good, you have to be very sensitive to bring out, uh, you know, the music or, or the art, whatever it is. And this, this, this artist, you know, has gone above and beyond. It, he, does, he didn't just paint something on a vase. He made the vase part of the world. Yeah, oh. uh, yeah. I mean, 
I agree. And I just want to say that Sandy um, says in the chat, if you blow it up, there were orange and red flowers at the gate. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It just gets better and better, doesn't it? Mm hmm So let me go ahead and summarize um, kind of what we've, we've seen here. Um, and one more comment from Sally is that it's very lyrical and he's created a sense of movement. And I, I have to agree with that, Sally. You know, when when I read that he had also studied piano, I could kind of see a rhythm in the piece, you know, that, that could be related to his musical abilities. Um, this artist is Mark Pizer. Um, he actually obtained his original degree was a Bachelor of Science from the Illinois Tech Institute of Technology in Chicago in 1961. And he worked briefly as an industrial designer in Chicago he also, um, in there, as I mentioned, studied piano. He then actually left Chicago and moved to um, Penland and um, studied at the Penland School of Crafts right here near Spruce Pine. Um, there, he um, started studying glass blowing. They really fascinated him. And obviously, I think we can see that fascination with it. He experimented with a wide variety of effects. We talked about that, that this was way more than just a piece of blown glass. In those effects, uh, different materials he used, molten glass, ceramic glaze powders, household products, and even rat poison, which he um, says makes beautiful bubbles. So as a couple of you commented, there's a lot more going on here than, than um, just blown glass. He's very involved with the studio glass movement starting in 1967. He spent five weeks blowing glass at Penland and became the first glass resident craftsman at the Penland um, School. He also built their first glass studio. So a very accomplished glass artist. And just so you know that uh, this, the name of this work is Crane Road Spring. So that might be some of the blue that you're seeing in the bottom there. It, was from 1980 and it is blown and torched worked glass. It's 11 and 3 eighths inches tall by six by six. So 11 inches and six inches each way. So any other comments before we move on? I, I have a question. It reminds me a little bit of Venetian glass, you know, that you see, um, you know, with, I think they use, I know, little individual pieces of glass and stretch it out to, to make the, um, the design. And I wonder whether that is what torch work means. Is, is, does anyone know what torch work glass means? Keeping the glass hot with a torch, I believe. As opposed to blowing glass, uh -huh. if that makes sense. So blowing glass, you're putting the glass in the furnace to keep it hot. When you're uh, working with a torch, you're uh, working with a more concentrated, you know, an actual torch to keep it hot and malleable in order to keep working with it. Do we know if it's a one of a kind or did he make it as part of a series? Um, it is one of a kind in that they are made one by one. Um, and I know that uh, phases like Crane Road Spring, once you start them, you have to finish them. So uh, sometimes it can take 10, 12, 15, even 24 hours to finish something from start to start to finish. And um, they have to keep working it uh, and can sort of work in um, shifts uh, in order to keep the glass hot. Um, so once you start, you can't stop. How? How does he apply those colors, the browns and the greens and the blues and the oranges? Uh, I'm a real dummy when it comes to the glass. And I think it's some of the things I mentioned that the different um, additions to glass that he has used is, you know, some ceramic powder and it's even rat poison. So I think those colors are accomplished in, in many different ways. But um, and I usually ask this question on these artworks when I do Is It Art, but I'm not this time because I think we pretty much all know the answer, and that is, is it art? I think we're 100% agreement that yes, it is. Um, so but does he apply them um, with a torch, or does he apply them with a brush, uh, these, these chemicals that turn into colors? I believe that he uh, is drawing on the glass with canes. So you get the canes hot. 
uh, so that they're molten. So canes are long, skinny pieces of glass. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can basically apply them once they're hot, the, the base glass is hot and the canes are hot. Mm -hmm. You can almost draw with them. And then when you blow the glass, it, it opens them up. Uh, that makes sense. That makes sense. So I would highly recommend uh, folks going to when it's safe and you can. I think that it right now they're not accepting visitors, but to go to the North Carolina Glass Center, um, they blow glass every day and you can watch uh, artists uh, making glass. Uh, North Carolina Glass Center, you could also go to Lexington uh, Glass Works and of course uh, other places up near Penland um, that have uh, hot shops working. At North Carolina Glass Center, you can even um, take a like a one hour glass class and, and make your own paperweight. I did that. It was a fantastic experience. So anyway, with that said, let's move on in the interest of time. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the program over to my um, colleague, Steve Bennett, for the next piece. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Hank, so much. Yeah. All right. Uh, as Hank said, I'm Steve Bennett. I'm a touring docent at the museum. And uh, I, I just feel so lucky to be a part of this arts community, but uh, I was recently in the museum uh, after they reopened the museum, and it was fun to get in there and see some of my favorites and uh, see what things had moved away and what had been put in its place. But while I was there in another visit, I noticed two new exhibitions, and both of them dealt with ceramics or pottery, if you will, and uh, both of those are on um, the landings, uh, landing two and uh, landing three. So we'll be talking about these next two uh, artworks that come from both of those landings, those exhibitions. Um, let's take a few more minutes and just uh, observe this piece left to right, top to bottom, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so what's going on in this artwork? What I see, this is Joey. Uh, this reminds me, and don't laugh, but it reminds me of a Prohibition era moonshine still pot. <laughs> <laughs> and one that had to be patched. I could use a drink right now, but. <laughs> <laughs> So this Joey sees uh, a still in this, uh, in this. I think that's very creative. Um, yeah, so what do you see that really makes you think it's a still though, Joey? Well, I see like at the base, there's a, you know, a cylinder and then, a, you know, inverted funnel on top and maybe a chimney like where, you know, you would cook the, whatever the mash is and then it would distill up into the chimney and then go off and, and come out into your moonshine somewhere. You, you, that piece isn't there, but that, and then, the, and then the little patches, it looks like he's patched the still pot and that looks intentional. It looks like they're made to be seen as, as um, holes that have been bandaged up somehow. Like you would see in an old fashioned still out in the mountain someplace. It well, reminded, you, yes, you're, <laughs> go ahead. It reminded me of a smudge pot that they use in the orange groves in Southern California to keep the frost away. Um, yeah. And that was just based on the shape um, and the color. It okay, so the color and the shape of this uh, make you, uh, remind you of the smudge pots. That's a very interesting concept. Uh, so is it morely the mm -hmm. shape of the object? Is that what it is? Yeah. It evokes right. a different. Okay, shape. anyone else? Yeah, I was going to say the other um, glass blowing one that we just saw that looked very much alive. To me, this evokes a very different feeling, like mm -hmm. a dead weight. It's just the color, the material. Um, I could almost see this being like like a foot. I mean, it, that sounds kind of weird, but like an amputated foot, like someone's um, mm -hmm. just <laughs> very dire. Okay, so you see a foot there, and uh, also the texture and everything makes you uh, think of something entirely different from a still. I can see uh, the texture and, um, and the shape. All right, anyone else? I, I, I think, think it's very yeah. unsettling. 
I would I I saw two different things. I also saw like a smokestack of an old chimney out in the woods somewhere, or even in a a, a garage or a, a cabin that had been patched and repaired. But I also saw uh, an old funnel mm -hmm. that's been used uh -huh. and, and abused. <laughs> but, uh, Turn it over. I had trouble thinking about whether it was art. I I had trouble thinking about whether it was art, and I still haven't quite decided, quite honestly. What is the material? Uh, this material is actually pottery. It's ceramic. Uh, but okay. the way he's applied various aspects to this original form, I think, throws you off. But yes, it's a kind of a brownish, blackish color. Um, Interesting concept, though. I hadn't thought about the funnel. That's very good. How big is it? This is actually about 16 inches high. It's not very tall. Um, not very and probably about 8 inches in diameter. Yeah, I don't know who said so, it. Uh, it. It does have a, a, a teepee-ish look to it, like you would have, I guess, in a teepee the traditional teepees you're familiar with from movies, you, you would have a smokestack at the top where, where a fire smoke could come out of. So another, just another picture of this. Oh, that's, that's a good point. It could be a, a smokestack. Very good uh, observation. Anybody else? So if we look in the chat, it looks like Sally um, says it looks like heavy buckle boots. Um, and then Sandy says it reminds her of Peter Valkas. What's the piece on the far left? It is another strap. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, the questions come up earlier, but do you think this is art? Yes. Most definitely. Anybody else? Barbara, what makes you say that? You didn't hesitate. Oh, no. Um, well, partly the material. I mean, you know, it's not just a cardboard box. Um, somebody had to form it and make it. And, I, and, it, and it evokes emotion, for me, a little bit of unsettling because it's broken and patched. <laughs> I want to I fix it better. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you see a patched object here. Uh, very good. Uh, any other comments? <clears throat> to me, it's art because I don't view it as being functional. It, it doesn't look to me like you could do anything with it or use it to do anything unless you're going to use it as a paperweight or mash something. So I, I think it's meant to <laughs> be visual, which then makes it art. Well, that's one challenge with viewing something that's three-dimensional here, just looking at a slide. But uh, when you visit the museum and the landing exhibition, you'll see that this is actually a, an open vessel sort of thing. So it could possibly be used as something utilitarian. Uh, but that's interesting you would say that. Um, so if you own this piece, if you own this uh, artwork, would you uh, treat it as a functional object or would you display it on a shelf as, uh, as art. I would use it as a vase and put flowers and branches in because I, I can imagine the juxtaposition. And to the earlier question you asked, is it art? Um, it is, it, it is an art object, yes. The way the clay is executed, um, all the different aspects here, um, and then going up the neck, you know, it's very organic the way he or she is using the clay and the opening. Yeah, it's, it's art okay. to me. And I would use it, yeah. Right. Any other comments? Sandy in the chat says, um, went to the question of is it art, she says it's sculpture. So I think mm -hmm. that's another one to agree with it. It is art. Correct. Very good. Well, uh, thank you for all your comments. Let's move along and find out something about this artist. Uh, Christy, if you could show us that. Thank you. Um, all right, this uh, particular artwork nice. is entitled Akan. 
And uh, the uh, potter or ceramicist here is Robert Chapman Turner. And uh, he was born in 1913 and uh, died in 2005. Uh, but this is a part of Asheville's collection, the Black Mountain collection. It was acquired in 2019. And I have mentioned those uh, exhibitions. You can find this on level three, uh, fantastical form, ceramic sculpture. And I think it's a wonderful exhibit. I hope you can make it down and see that. Um, a little hold, information about, pardon? Is he holding that in the little picture of the artist? Is he holding that? No, same? that's a lamp. Well, Good eye, Joey. We're, we're, not, <laughs> we're not exactly sure. Uh, what he did uh, was a oh. series I will talk about a little later. Oh. Um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, a, a series. And uh, this was one of the uh, artworks in that series. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Chapman, Robert Chapman Turner was born in Port Washington, New York, and he was an American potter known for functional pottery and also for sculptural vessels. He got his BA from Swarthmore in 1936, and later he taught at Alfred University of Art and Design. Wow. Now here's the local connection though. Uh, some years later, he moved to North Carolina and he started the ceramics department at Black Mountain College. And he also taught summer sessions over at Finland. So um, I think that is very interesting that this man has spent so much time here in our area. Um, and one important um, period of his career, though, that I think was just very influential was in the 70s, he traveled to Nigeria and also to Ghana. And he was deeply moved by the way in which art was ingrained in people's daily experience there. And so he returned to the States and he began a, a series of distinctive vessel types, and he named them after African kingdoms, including the Akan kingdom and its peoples. So here you see the influence of this very uh, piece of artwork we have here in front of us. Um, he's showing us here how utilitarian forms can be seen as sculptures. Um, another big influence in his life was he was a lifelong Quaker and his beliefs had a profound effect on his life. He, um, he wrote once and I'm quoting him here, it says, what part if any, can and should the art world play in revitalizing people of perhaps an insensitive or degenerative culture. He said, art and those who know its importance need to make art a more vital and integral part of the community's life. And he says, uh, this way you address society's spiritual needs and many others. And I thought that was really, really heavy, but very uh, important. Um, he had a 60 year career and he was mainly a ceramic artist all that time and won many awards, but probably the most important one was the gold medal that was presented to him from the American Craft Council. And he died in 2005. Um, one final note, this is an interesting artwork, but there is in fact a hole in the bottom of this object. So it cannot be used as a true functional vessel or a bud vase. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Any more comments before we move on? Bad. I'm wondering if if this is named after um, a group of people or uh, ethnic group. Is this an image, perhaps, of a hut, like a, a, a traditional oh. West African or historical West African hut? You know, it with, is actually based. It is based upon the work that he saw in those African kingdoms. And this is the Akan kingdom he actually visited. And uh, I believe that this is a, a sculptural form that they do use in the vessels that they have there. Um, so it had a profound effect on him. And there are a lot of other ones named after other kingdoms in Africa. Okay, well, thank you very much for your help on this. I think we'll move ahead to the next slide. And like before, let's just take a few moments to uh, examine this left to right and top to bottom, and uh, we'll talk in just a second. Okay, what's going on here in this art? Work? 
It has a Japanese feel to it. It's a little mouse house. Right, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara, Barbara sees a definite Asian influence here and, and maybe a, 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 you know, a little place for a mouse to live. What else? <laughs> I think it's cute. I, I like the colors and I, I like the texture. It looks like the pattern is repeated. You know, we're seeing a flat slide on a three-dimensional item, but you see the little bubbles and the black leaves mm -hmm. on the orange. And if you move to the left, you can sort of see before you go around the other side of the little object, you can see what looks to be more bubbles and another black leaf. So it looks like you could lift off the lid. I'm not sure if you can, but it looks like you can. So you uh, can see part of what you believe is um, uh, a functional motif that perhaps goes around the uh, circumference of this vessel. All right. Anyone else? It comes from an entirely different culture, but I'm very reminded of the Dutch item they called a stove that you put charcoal in and you, in a ceramic, piece that looks a lot like this in shape and lid and it would keep your feet warm in the winter. <laughs> and Sandy mentions in the chat that the rim and the lid are the same color, which I think is noteworthy. And um, something that I now see after Laurel's comment where she called the white dots bubbles um, kind of gave me a whole different view of this artwork. And it, it, it to me, it sort of then made me think of maybe this is a scene where we've got possibly bamboo, which those leaves are kind of bamboo-like sort of hanging over water. So that just her comment there made me see things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So you have, you see some organic influences there, some uh, leaves and perhaps water bubbles and things like that. Very good. The shape of the lid and the texture are monochrome compared to the base. And I think that adds greatly to the sculptural effect um, and impression for me. And I'm wondering what that little round opening is, of course, like other people have said. And the uh, vessel itself seems to be um, oval, whereas the uh, lid has a more distinct um, triangular shaping, at least on this side and probably on the other side. So the lid looks interesting. Mm -hmm. Very sculptural. I'd, like I'd like to look inside. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and because then you could see down to the bottom and find out whether it basically divides the two halves into legs mm -hmm. or um, or is it empty? Does it just go down? Well, Laura, you've planted mm -hmm. the seed now. I I'm afraid to open it because I feel like there's going to be a little family of mice or something <laughs> in there. It's so perfect. <laughs> I wonder, is there another hole on the other side? You know, could you like walk through that little shadowed hole on the bottom and something else when the rim was mentioned if you go facing the object to the left of the orange and the what I call the bubbles or the bamboo the, the rim looks to be a little chipped there at the top yeah I don't know if that's wear and tear or if that's part of the artist's intention it could be a reflection I'd have to go look at it it might be a glare just from the lights um from the photography, but I'd have to go look at it, Laurel. Yes, I was wondering if the hole at the bottom was actually, you know, a chip, if it's centuries old. I think that it's there. Oh, and I know that I, my resolution on my screen is probably a little bit better than folks, but if you can see, there's, you can see where the um, glaze has gathered there. So um, it was original left okay. there by the artist or put there by the artist on purpose. I'm not sure, but uh, isn't a break. I, I think this is, I, I stepped away for a second, but it looks like a footed casserole 
dish and I'd love to open it up and see a nice stew in there because it's kind of cold. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be yeah. right over. <laughs> well, that leads us to our next question. Do you see this as being a functional uh, artwork or something that is uh, merely decorative that you would place on a shelf? How do you see this piece? I think it can serve as either one. Mm -hmm. Or both. Mm -hmm. I would display Anyone it on the else? shelf, but I would use it as a serving piece because it's if it could be used that way because it's beautiful. It may not have a bottom. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a problem. <laughs> no, seriously. See the shadow yeah. at the bottom there. Mm -hmm. See the shadow. It it may mm -hmm. not have a bottom. I would put it on a shelf. I'd be afraid to use it. I I don't know how you would wash it or clean it, and I'd be afraid of damaging it. Well, I guess the next question in my mind is, is this art? What do you think? Of course. Of course. Anybody? Well, the, you're bringing up a subject of, is China art? Is the China that you use at your home, is that art? Very good point. Anyone else? In the chat, Micah says it's art. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Mm -hmm. Laurel says definitely art, so she doubled down. <laughs> <laughs> good, Laurel, good. Sandy asks if Any it's other... one of a kind, it is uh, made by the hand of the artist, it's not manufactured. Right. I think that would be the a difference, one of the differences. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Any other comments on this before we move forward? Okay, uh, Christy, could we see the label slide? Okay, what we've been looking at is entitled Lidded Jar Stoneware. And it is by Douglas Rankin and Will Ruggles. It was created about 1983. Uh, but you, uh, you may not know this, but Douglas here is a female artist. And you can see the picture down there. It's an unusual name, but apparently it was a common name for girls in Shakespeare's day. But Douglas actually attended Duke University and she received a degree in botany there. But while she was at Duke, she took one class in pottery, and she really loved it. So she ended up moving up to Wisconsin after her work at Duke was completed. And she went to a fairly well-known pottery studio there. It's called Randy Johnson's Pottery Studio. And it's in uh, River Falls, Wisconsin. So um, Will Ruggles, the other person there shown in the middle is uh, Raised in Indiana, he studied pottery while in college in Michigan. Uh, his route was a bit different. He left to pursue interest in ancient, ancient Asian pottery. And while he was doing that, he found Zen Buddhism in the process. Um, he went to Taiwan. He also traveled to Thailand. And then uh, he moved back to the States and went to Wisconsin. So he became an apprentice with the Randy Johnson there at the same time that um, his uh, partner was. And so they met in 1977. Both were apprentices at the Johnson studio. Um, both artists continued to be influenced by Zen Buddhism and that teaches that all things are interdependent and interwoven. And this became the organizing principle of their life and their career. Um, but there is another local collection connection here with this artwork. Um, they moved to North Carolina and they moved specifically to Bakersville, North Carolina. I don't know if you've ever been to Bakersville, but I was there recently and uh, it's only like an hour and 15 minutes from Asheville, but well worth the drive on a Saturday to go through some of the galleries. Um, yeah, this is that. where they were located. And the Rock Creek Pottery, uh, they established there on the mountainside. They designed, they manufactured, and they sold pots from there. And they did this from 1980 uh, up until 2007. Uh, but all this time, 
that particular site became a pilgrimage site for potters throughout this region and beyond. And um, like I said, they closed it in 2007, and they upped and moved to New Mexico and said they wanted to search for new adventures. So uh, from all I can tell, they've not established another pottery there. But I'd like to end with a quote from this couple, which I think is just really explains them to a T. It says, we take the material form millions of years ago and make something that we use to serve salad that we have grown in our own garden. This is a very primal process and we find that extremely nourishing. So, mm. any other comments? All right, Hank, I'm gonna turn it back over to you at this point. All right, Christy, if you could then put the next slide up there, take a look at it folks, and then we'll talk about it. So what do you see? What's going on? Well, I've got the word time, and I can't get past that. <laughs> it's the it's myth. Hard to focus on it. Time? Myth. Yeah. It looks like a woman's dress, like a shift back from maybe like the 60s, you know. Um, that's what it looks like. So, um, from what I've heard, we've got one person that's kind of stuck on the word time, and that's just so big and bold. That's that's all that they see. And then Laurel says it looks like a, a dress, and it actually is a dress um, mm -hmm. from the 60s. Uh, anybody else? What do you think? Definitely, I get a mod sense, so I agree, like a 60s um, style dress. It looks like something you'd buy in a souvenir shop uh, at one of the big art museums. Actually, I see that. It does look like something you would go into the museum shop at the end of your tour and, and purchase. <laughs> um, let me throw something else in there to kind of um, give you some more, something else to chew on. And that is, this is made of printed microwoven cellulose, or what you and I would call paper. Does that change your view or give you any other thoughts or some new insight into this? Well, I remember when paper dresses were popular just for a nanosecond. Was that in the 70s? I can't remember when it was. It was actually in the mid-60s. Mid -60s. Um, so if we, anybody else got anything? Knowing well, that it's made out of paper, um, I think we have here this sort of white on either side of it and a little bit of a white background from the dress. I'm wondering if it was originally, you know, pure black and pure white and it sort of faded to that sepia color the way that paper does, or if it was meant to be sort of like a, a cream and black. So it could just be that, right, it, it, it's hard to say if it really was pure black and white and the, and the white is just sort of aged to that sort of- Over time or, or with use, <laughs> human, human wearing it um, so, would, I think, soil paper. You know, if, you're, if you hold a piece of paper in your hand, uh, it eventually gets soiled from the natural oils in our skin. And um, Sandy says she's been thinking of printing press, so she was happy to know learn that it was paper. <laughs> um, so if we look at that in the big time written all over the dress, does that remind you of any other artists of the uh, recent, of the 60s, 70s? Oh, what's his name? Andy Illinois. Warhol. Warhol. Love. Definitely Warhol. Or Indiana. It, Robert yeah, Indiana. Robert Laura, Indiana. is that who you were thinking of? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I said Illinois. I mean, that's. <laughs> <laughs> but right, Indiana, Robert Indiana, Andy Warhol, it does have a very pop art look to it. And um, so in, if you think about pop art, that was very much part of the pop art movement, was a commentary on the time 
So, which which like this says time, but with that in mind, does that bring any other thoughts? Well, it's disposable, which is, you know, a mixed blessing today, you know, disposable ruins the environment, but also you're thinking of, of hospital gowns and stuff that are, we're, we're in short supply of right now, you know, PPE. And that's what it brings to mind. So it's like a mixed, you know, bad disposable, but good because, you know, maybe disposable is more sanitary. Okay, here's a, here's a radical idea. Time is very fleeting. And this artwork could be very fleeting because it could be destroyed very easily. Right. If it weren't in a museum, right, Barbara, with a museum <laughs> sort of preserving it. I had the exact same thought, Barbara, so you and I are on the same wavelength. But also, you know, not only that paper doesn't last as long as other materials, but fashion is also, you know, comes and goes in the blink of an eye. And so time would be sort of the enemy of this dress surviving for a lot of different reasons or having significance. Mm -hmm. Right. I agree that it looks like it's faded as like it wasn't well preserved and it probably was used. And I, I think of it not being fireproof. I mean, I know today pajamas and so many other things have to be like made of certain materials or you're not allowed to, to wear them. They're not approved because they're not fireproof. And mm. uh... so it, 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 that's very true. Today, this probably would not be legal to wear because, you know, you could be smoking a cigarette and, and ash drops and poof, your dress is gone. Um, also, the word time to me, and I thought it was interesting that you all mentioned that fashion is fleeting and sort of a time-based um, uh, perspective, and also the fact that a paper dress is not going to last that long, and there's a time element there. And when I thought about pop art being a commentary of, of the time that the art was created, I thought about with the word time on here, Time Magazine, which also tends to be a commentary on what's going on you know, in, in that day. So that was the thought I had about it. And it's the same font. Time Magazine uses that font. Yeah, I wondered about that, Barbara. It's a little hard for me because uh, I think somebody else also saw the word met, which is always what I see. And when mm -hmm. I was talking to Steve and Hank earlier, I called it the met dress <laughs> because that's just, <laughs> those are the letters that jump out at me. But um uh, I agree. I was wondering if it was the same uh, font as the mm -hmm. uh, banner of the magazine. It is? Okay. I think so. So anybody else have any comments? Yeah, I, I, I think the distribution or the artfulness of the final work here, the distribution of the uh, white, off-white ivory and the black created through this very intricate lettering system makes it into an abstract piece. And I find it very, very intriguing and attractive. Very good, so that black and white kind of leads you to an abstract pattern there. Um, Sandy says, if the paper dress is art and stored, Paper lasts forever is a memory recording of the times. So <laughs> another good point, and that actually was the next question I was going to ask since our, our time is, is running light here. Um, do you all think this is art? Oh, Def. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Right. And, and anybody want to... I think it wasn't made to be worn. I think maybe the an artist created this just as a display as an art piece. So even though a dress is a functional item, it, in your view, this particular dress is not, it's, it's for display. Right. Do we know that it's a dress? It could be an apron with that curve up there. Mm -hmm. It would so, still be art if it was a one of a kind created. And, Come it likely was not a one of a kind, and we're going to get into some little very interesting details. When um, Steve did some research on this, and then I did some additional reading, and I was like, oh, wow, this is so interesting. So anybody else have a comment? 
you know, you mentioned it, maybe it was intentionally art. At, at, in the Appalachian Now exhibit that we had, we had a blacksmith, a woman blacksmith that made a negligee. I think it was a negligee or something like that out of metal. And so this mm. brings to mind that, that artwork too. Well, and, and you know, when I had, was trying to go through that question myself of is it art, um, I thought about, you know, contemporary art particularly, especially in the 20 and 21st century, a lot of contemporary artists, their goal was experimenting with materials. And I think it's very much as an experimentation of materials. And also a lot of contemporary art, actually art historically has been a commentary on the times. And this one very much is too. It's paper, it's disposable, it's modern. Um, so it, it, to me, it is art. Let's flip to the next slide, Chrissy, so we can um, talk a little bit about it. This is a Time Magazine dress. Oh, there you go. <laughs> manufactured by Mars of Asheville around mm -hmm. 1965. Um, interestingly enough, Mars of Asheville was a manufacturing um, company here in Asheville, actually in West Asheville. And they made um, nylon hose, the kind that had the seam that went up the back of your leg. And I can remember my mother talking about those, those stockings and making sure the seam was straight. Well, as that became less profitable, um, they moved into paper dresses. Um, and someone asked if this was a one of a kind. They actually would get a wallpaper company, Scott, in Wisconsin to print rolls of paper that would be shipped to West Asheville, and then they would cut out and make these dresses. And if you look in the lower left corner of the slide, you'll see a yellow page themed dress. They also made a Nixon themed dress when I guess he was running for office in the in the uh, mid 60s. And these dresses sold for a dollar. So that was part of the <laughs> the uh, the whole marketing niche here is it was a dollar, it was disposable, you could wear it a few times, toss it, and easily buy another dress. As fashions and patterns changed, you could easily buy another dress. They made dresses, they made men's vests, children's pajamas, which, as Laurel said, would now not be legal. Um, although I did read that these were somewhat flame proof. I'm not quite sure what that means. They also made evening wear for women, which sold for $5 for an evening gown. I know this is crazy, but I think they also made <laughs> bathing suits, paper bathing suits. Yes, they did. I did read that too, bathing suits. <laughs> That they were somewhat water resistant. I also read that tonight. <laughs> and, and that'll somewhat, I'm not sure what that means. And Sally says, wasn't there also a MasterCard dressing? And quite likely there could have been. We have um, one in our collection, yeah. MasterCard dress. So, and eventually, in the, as the mid 60s started to move to the late 60s, and the hippie movement um, started to gain prominence. And paper dresses kind of fell out of favor because there was a whole, you know, back to the earth, natural fabrics movement going on. So paper dresses became less profitable. This company then moved to making um, disposable manufacturing um, clothing, medical clothing, and so on. I could not find any information about what eventually happened to the company. You know, I looked and looked and looked, and I, I guess they're out of business, but I really couldn't find anything definite. But at one time, they were making 80,000 dresses a month. So Laurel says, thank you. And, and I am going to wrap that up by saying thanks to all of you for the Slower Friday. As I mentioned to those of you that have joined me before, um, one of the things I like the most about Slower Fridays is when, after we get to talking, I see so much of these artworks that I would not see if I just went and looked at it. But, but you all sharing your view of what you see, it's like, wow, I never even thought about that. So thank you all so much. As this is my last Slow Art Friday this year, I want to wish you all a happy holiday and a very good new year. And hopefully we'll get to do some in-person tours uh, at some point next year. So with that said, I will turn it back to Christy. 
fingers crossed, good news from the FDA today. So hopefully we can all see each other in person again soon. Uh, thank you, Steve and Hank, as always. You guys do such a great job, and I, too, see so much um, by having these conversations with you all in the docents. So thank you for your insights and for sharing what you see. Uh, next week, December 18th, we will have uh, a Slow Art Friday called Women in a Material World. So the three artworks that Sylvie Horvath and Michelle Weitzman-Dorf, our two touring docents who are leading that program, uh, the artworks that they've cho chosen all feature women and are in a variety of media. So if you'd like to join us, please do uh, sign up. We also have uh, all of the January Slow Art Fridays posted on our website. So have a, have a look and see if anything sounds uh, interesting. And if so, we definitely invite you to sign up and join us uh, one Friday in January. Thanks again, Steve, Hank, and all of you. We hope you have a great weekend. Talk to you soon.